Welcome to our second Hexham debate of 2024. Um, I'm just going to pause a little while and waiting for people to join us. <clears throat> we had about 60 people in the end um, attending the first um, debate live and then others will have been watching the recording. The numbers are just going up. <laughs> So today we have Rupert Reed with us, who's standing, waiting. Um, and so he'll speak for about half an hour, maybe a little bit less, because he wants plenty of time for discussion. Um, if you want to, you can put your questions in the in the comments section if you so you don't forget them. But we're not using that as a general chat; it's just to post questions that we'll have um, once Rupert's finished speaking. So for future debates, we did used to send out a, um, a particular link, but you can always access um, the live debates just by going to either Hexham Debates or Hexham TV Facebook pages or the Hexham TV on YouTube. So you no longer need a specific um, email with the link in it. And you can go to those same places for recordings if you want to see the recording afterwards or recommend it to your friends. And the other reminder is we've set up um, a donations um, a method you can do by text and we'll put up those details at the end. And um, there's a QR code if you want to just scan that it donates five pounds or there's a text number where you can put in the amount that you'd like to donate. Um, and that's just to cover costs of um, doing the live broadcast and also our in-person panel discussions where we rent a room um, and then publicity. <clears throat> So I'm just going to start introducing um, Rupert while we wait for people to continue to join. Um, so Rupert Reed actually last presented as part of the Hexham debates in March 2020, just as the world was changing. Um, and he was our first online speaker, showed us how well it work, could work. And we haven't looked back. So here we are still online, um, but with our additional panel discussions that are in person. So Dr. Rupert Reed is co-director of the Climate Majority Project. He was previously a spokesperson and political strategist. Uh, I knew I wouldn't be able to say that strategist for Hexham for Extinction Rebellion and a spokesperson, national um, parliamentary candidate, European parliamentary candidate, and councillor for the Green Party of England and Wales. Today, he's going to be speaking on the topic of: Is there a climate majority? Realistic reflections on where we are and where we should be. So we'll go to, to Rupert now, just bringing him up on screen. Welcome, Rupert. Thank you. And yeah, let's get started. I am going to speak fairly succinctly, I hope, because I'm going to take literally the title of this event. These are the Hexham Debates, and I'm very keen to engage with you on this pretty vital topic that we're going to be talking about here this morning. So let's start with some reflections on where we are. And I'm not going to spend a long time on this, partly because I suspect that many people tuning into this debate will be aware, in broad outline at least, of where we are in terms of the extreme seriousness of our situation, in terms of the climate, also in other respects. But I will just emphasize a few points because my suspicion and my experience is that most people, even if they are interested, tuned in, well-informed, trying to follow what's happening, are not fully apprised of just how serious the situation is, just how dire it is, not to put too fine a point on it. Our situation is a lot, a lot worse than it was four years ago when I last spoke here. It's a lot worse than it was one year ago. To illustrate that, I've got a slide I want to show you. If you can put the first slide up, please, Peter. So here we go. This is a graph of the global temperature anomaly over the last uh, 80 years. And you can see it's kind of bobbling along 
with the pre-industrial baseline there. And then it starts going up. The lighter colors are more recent years. And then suddenly last year, that's the yellow line. Uh, it's gone kind of pretty crazy. And it's going above the, uh, the Paris so-called safe limit of 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial temperatures. And this year, well, that's the red line so far. And you can see it's even further um, still, uh, a lot further up than it was last year. Something has happened quite suddenly, uh, which has made global temperatures go pretty berserk and has made the whole idea of staying below 1.5 degrees, which is still allegedly the objective of everybody, into a kind of a joke, I'm afraid. Uh, it's quite starkly obvious now that that is not going to happen. So where we are is very definitely out of the safe zone. Uh, you can take that slide down now, please. I could also talk about this in other terms. There is what's happening in the sea temperatures, which is particularly extreme. And that's significant for a number of reasons, including that, of course, it takes a lot more energy. It takes a lot more heat to heat up the sea than it does to heat up the atmosphere. Or I could talk about what's happening with ocean currents. If you haven't been following that story recently, it is particularly interesting. There is a big story just broken uh, in The Guardian and elsewhere uh, about that literally in the last 24 hours. The Amok current system uh, is, uh, is one to be aware of. It's much bigger than the Gulf Stream, which most of us are aware of. And basically, the Amok current system is in trouble. And the reason why, ironically, is because of substantial ice melt in Greenland, uh, etc., in the Arctic. Um, which is meaning that a whole load of cold water is pouring into the North Atlantic at the same time as you've got this extra heating going on across the Atlantic and elsewhere. Basically, to cut a long story short, the amok is being destabilized and there is now a significant chance that within the lifetimes of many of us uh, on this call, it could basically collapse. What would that mean? Well, it would mean many things, most of them awful around the world. But what's perhaps especially striking is that it would mean particularly bad things for the east coast of America, which would be liable to be uh, much more inundated much more quickly than was otherwise forecast, and for Europe, and in particular for places like, you guessed it, the British Isles, because we, of course, bask in the warm waters of the Gulf Stream. Otherwise, we could have potentially a semi-Siberian uh, climate, or at least the kind of climate that they have on the same kind of latitude in Canada. Uh, and well, that is what could happen. Uh, we could be thrown quite quickly, a terrible irony, through global overheating, melting ice, we could be thrown quite quickly into a much colder and much drier climate. Now, reasons to be cheerful. <laughs> One potential good thing about this awful news about the Amok uh, is that maybe it will help wake up policymakers and citizens at large uh, in the United States, in Europe, in in particular uh, the UK, because some people have been thinking, well, yeah, climate change, it's bad, but it's mainly affecting people in the global south, poor people, etc. It's, it's not really affecting us that much. That might be a selfish and stupid uh, attitude. Well, it is a selfish and stupid attitude, but it is also a sort of vaguely understandable uh, attitude in the sense that you can see why people who are a bit selfish and a bit stupid would fall into thinking uh, that way. Well, the amok is something which throws all of that uh, into doubt. Um, the great irony, as I say, is that if the amok starts to collapse, it will affect uh, Europe uh, and the eastern side of the US worse probably than anywhere else in the world, although it will also have bad effects uh, elsewhere. Maybe that's the kind of wake up call that we really do need and could get us somewhere because where we are is really dire. I'm not going to go on about it more. I'm happy to discuss it more uh, in questions. Uh, as I say, my experience is that most people, even who follow this, don't quite understand just how desperate the situation is. And our view in the Climate Majority Project, which I head up, is that this is one crucial part of the puzzle. We need to deepen the climate majority by enabling people to understand just how bad the situation is. That's one part, we say, of the puzzle. I'll come to what the others are in a minute. But first, I want to 
come directly to the question which is raised in the title of my talk here today. Is there a climate majority? So let's go to the next lot of slides, please. Um, what you're having here in these slides is answers to an opinion poll put by Ipsos Mori. The opinion poll, opinion poll, very recent, was organized by an organization called People Get Real. People Get Real is a collaborator of the Climate Majority Project. And what the, the People Get Real poll seeks to do is to probe into the level of climate concern and to break that down. So this is the first question on the poll. How concerned or unconcerned are you about climate change in general? And you see there, well, there is a very healthy majority who are concerned. That's the most simple starting point for understanding the sense in which there is already a climate majority. It's not, as I put it a minute ago, quite deep enough in that most people are not as concerned, frankly, as they should be. But there is already a clear majority in this country and virtually every other country in the world, in fact, uh, who are concerned at the, the situation. So that's the initial meaning of the term climate majority. Let's go to the next slide now, dig deeper into this poll. How prepared or unprepared do you think governments around the world are to make immediate and deep emissions reductions across all sectors? And those, of course, are what is needed in response to this mother of all crises. And you see there a very clear majority saying unprepared. So that's quite a realistic appraisal, appraisal it seems to me, uh, that the citizenry of this country have of our situation. Let's go to the next slide. This one is really quite interesting. To what extent do you agree or disagree with the following statements? This is trying to do the, the thing which is often talked about of assessing where people stand on the question of balance, if there is a balance between economic growth on the one hand uh, and climate risks on the other. So when you ask people, should priority be given to economic growth and jobs, even if it risks making the climate worse, people are kind of evenly split. If you ask people, let's go, if we stay on this slide, but if you cast your eye down to the third uh, bar on the graph, if you ask people about this statement, priority should be given to reducing carbon emissions, even if it risks slowing economic growth, then we get pretty much a majority, almost 49% saying, yeah, that's right. Now, this is very interesting. What it suggests is that there is just about a majority who, at least in the abstract, when they're asked a polling question, might be harder if they get to a polling booth. But if they're asked this question, they, they actually say, yeah, they actually recognize, you know what, this is more important than economic growth, right? The, that figure in that third um, bar of that chart is pretty stark and striking. Half the people are say, yeah, priority should be given to reducing carbon emissions. Uh, and a much smaller number say, no, it shouldn't. Uh, and one more um, slide, please. The final slide from this poll that we're going to see now. Um, this is about how people want to want to be communicated to about climate. And again, this is incredibly striking. What we're often told is, oh, people don't want to hear bad news. Uh, they uh, would rather be told... Um, um, happy stories about how things are going to be okay and about the sunlit uplands than face the truth. This poll suggests something different again. Uh, so look at that first statement. Bad news should be shared whether there are solutions or grounds for optimism or not. The overwhelming majority of people are said yes, they agree with that statement. Now it's true people also um, say about the same percentage say that solutions should be offered alongside bad news. And about half, but significantly less uh, than for the other two um, bars on the chart, say it's good to be optimistic when delivering bad news. But that first bar there is really, really striking. 68% say, share the bad news, tell us the truth, whether there are solutions or grounds for optimism or not. And you can take that slide down now, thank you. So what's so important about that from our perspective is that it shows very clearly there is a climate majority. There is a majority of people who want to hear the truth. They understand the situation is bad. And indeed, there's a suggestion in those polling results that 
They sense perhaps that the situation may be even worse than they know, and they're ready to hear worse bad news if that is what there is, as indeed there is. So that's the sense in which there categorically is a climate majority, even though it needs further uh, deepening. Let's turn now to the question of why this is so important. It's so important because there is no way we get to get anywhere on this matter without the majority. This is not like the ozone hole, which could essentially be solved by a bunch of governments and a bunch of big corporations agreeing something together, uh, which they did very excellently uh, in the 1980s and found a way forward. The climate is affected by and affects virtually everything that we do. Our lives are saturated with carbon and with other um, fossil fuels and greenhouse gases and with the relationship of those to nature uh, and the, the feedbacks that, uh, that occur there through the growth of trees, the die off of trees, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Everything that we do almost has an impact one way or another on this matter. There's no way we get to go forward on this without getting most people on side in the end. It's an illusion to think you could have a sort of pure uh, eco-Leninist um, solution uh, to the climate crisis. There is no way through this without the majority. That is why it is so important that there is a climate majority that it is perhaps ready to be deepened. So what does or should the climate majority do? Uh, this is obviously an absolutely critical question. Now, for many of us, this start what we should do starts with appraising the truth in the kind of way that I've been seeking to do and what I've been laying out uh, in this talk uh, so far. Coming to terms with how bad uh, things are, being ready uh, to face that. But you know what? It's not enough to just dump the truth uh, on people. It's not enough to just be real. You have to give people help in handling it as well, right? We are prone to get depressed or anxious or desperate or to go into denial uh, and so on and so forth when we hear very tough, very bad news. These emotional responses are natural. They are natural responses to an unnatural situation that the human race has imposed uh, upon the planet. They deserve respect. They deserve to be destigmatized. They deserve to be resourced. What I mean by that is that wherever they are predictably produced, for example, in school where children are taught this stuff, there should be attention given to help, in hand help for people in handling those difficult emotions which are bound to be produced by learning about the facts. And that in fact is one of the key campaigns that the Climate Majority Project has now began to run. We have a campaign on climate distress where what we say is climate distress is a completely natural and normal response to an abnormal situation. It should be destigmatized and it should be resourced. And well, that's an example of what we should do. Uh, act to uh, resource uh, climate distress. And there are ways in which many of us can get involved in that. And that's the point of this campaign that we're running in the Climate Majority Project. It's for teachers. It's also relevant to journalists. It's relevant to civil servants. It's relevant to anybody whose role in life uh, involves um, facing up to the difficult truth and having to be to hold attention for the difficulties that people are having in facing up to that truth. So if we start with the idea of facing up to the, the truth, and if we uh, take next the idea of help in handling that, uh, that difficult truth, uh, those are the first two strands of the Climate Majority Project theory of change. The third strand is that tangible practical action will follow from people who are empowered and enabled to face the truth together. In other words, there's a chance of getting many, many people involved in the kind of action in our communities, 
in our workplaces, in our churches, in our political system, everywhere that needs to occur to deal with this ubiquitous uh, climate predicament uh, that we're in. There's a chance of that happening if people understand how bad the situation is and are given help in, in um, handling those difficult uh, uh, emotions. That takes us into action, into tangible, practical actions uh, that start to rise to the full gravity of the situation. That's the third strand of our theory of change. And the fourth strand is that we say it is crucial that there is understanding of all of this, of this entire um, sequence uh, of, uh, of thoughts and, uh, and tissue uh, of materials. Uh, and in particular, that there is shared understanding of the sense in which the climate majority is already here, can be deepened, can be helped to handle the truth, and can be given uh, roadmaps and routes into taking those vital, tangible, pra practical actions. And that, as I say, it is already happening. There are people already doing this. So one of the most central things that we do in the Climate Majority Project is we incubate uh, seed funds, support, etc., uh, and collaborate with uh, organizations that are moving into uh, this space brilliantly already. Organizations such as uh, General Council for uh, Sustainability Leadership, uh, which is senior corporate lawyers uh, um, trying to get their firms to do the right thing on the climate. I always uh, say, if senior corporate lawyers can do it, then I think anyone can do it. Um, community Climate Action, uh, Wildcard, who are engaged in uh, in rewilding uh, the royal lands and other lands uh, in this country uh, through innovative campaigning methods. Uh, MP Watch, holding our uh, MPs uh, to account. Um, Cadence Roundtable, our newest incubator, who are um, engaging in um, deep adaptational uh, approaches to um, uh, the predicament that we're in uh, with uh, people from across various spaces, including policymaking uh, spaces. We're incubating these initiatives that have already arisen. We're collaborating with others that have already arisen, and there are more uh, all the time. This is exciting. This is positive. When people come to understand that it's not just that there's a grim situation, but that that difficult reality can be held and can be acted upon and that others are already acting upon it. Other people just like you are already doing it. And that there is bound to be more and more of this as we go further into the maelstrom. Then they have a way of handling the situation uh, that is redoubled from uh, where they were before. Uh, and that takes us to the place where I want to um, culminate uh, this talk, uh, where we should be, right? Where are we headed here? Where do we need to be headed? And of course, a lot of us have a great deal of understanding uh, of that uh, already, uh, and some of it's kind of obvious. I want to put it to you now in the terms um, that we uh, in the Climate Majority Project uh, think of it. Uh, and, uh, and let me state it boldly, therefore, in this way. What we mean to do, what we in the Climate Majority Project aim to do by way of our uh, theory of change is to create a political culture where proper action on climate and ecology is an electoral deal breaker, meaning that parties are competing with each other to go further and do better. And if they don't, uh, then the electorate turn them down. So we're striving towards an ecological civilization with a changed political culture, an ecological civilization that can thrive and avoid the worst extremes of eco-driven societal collapse, which otherwise is what is coming to us, while maintaining realism about the harm that it's already too late to avoid and the equally pressing need for adaptation. Uh, as I say, we're incubating Cadence Roundtable. That's one example of the campaign that I will be leading for the Climate Majority Project over the next couple of years on adaptation, on strategic and transformative adaptation. It's pointless and impossible now to stick with mitigation-based approaches alone to our predicament, meaning it's too late to prevent the climate crisis. It's too late to prevent some significant degree of climate breakdown. It is here. You saw that uh, in that slide with which I started uh, this talk. There is no alternative now but to adapt. And the great thing about adaptation, if we do it strategically, if we do it transformatively, is that it can make everything better in the short, in the short term, where you are. It's not just something which is about uh, 2035 or 2050 or helping people in faraway places. That's all super worthwhile and super important. 
but adaptation can be visible to people uh, in the here and now. And therefore it makes the problem real. It makes the predicament real to people. It is itself a wake up call. When people engage in adaptation, when they engage in preparedness, in building practical as well as psychological uh, resilience, then what they do necessarily helps to wake everybody else up. So to sum that up, our mission in the Climate Majority Project is to mobilize climate concerned citizens from across the political spectrum. Remember, it's gonna take a, a majority, it's gonna take most of us. We can't do this in a polarized way. We can't do this with a small minority. To mobilize climate concerned citizens from across the political spectrum to enact effective, coordinated climate action at all levels of society and governance. That's where we should be. And that's the apogee, if you will, of our uh, theory of change. Um, so now let's uh, take to, to summarize what I've been saying in the last five or 10 minutes. Let's take the next slide, please. So this is, for those of you who like uh, diagrams, this is a visual representation of our theory of change. So if you see at the top there, you have um, a narrative shift towards truthfulness. That's the first trend of our theory of change that I spoke about uh, first. Um, that requires help in handling the difficult truth. So that means communities of awareness and resilience on the right-hand side uh, of the diagram. Um, those two together uh, are the best basis for tangible action, um, for tangible practical actions that will make things uh, better. That's the third strand of our theory of change. It is on the bottom uh, of the diagram that you have there. Uh, and putting all of those together adds up to building shared understanding, adds up to sense making, adds up to building this sense that the transformation that we're talking about here is inevitable, is already happening, is going to be positive in many of its respects for those who take part in it and for everybody else. And that the open questions are questions like, Will it happen deeply and widely enough? Will it happen fast enough? Will it happen wisely enough? Will it happen across the, the world enough? Those are the open questions about essentially whether we're gonna uh, make it or not in some sense. And that is the fourth strand of our theory of change, which ties all the others in. And the bits in between them, these, these um, sentences or, or phrases that uh, run between the different strands, they hopefully help you to see how these strands relate to each other. So, for example, if you look between the narrative shift um, strand and the communities of awareness and resilience strand, what you see is the difficult truth is easier to bear with support and community. That's how those two link together. Similarly, if you look from communities of awareness and resilience to tangible action, what you see is, for instance, acting towards a common cause brings communities together. That's how the second and third, that's one of the ways in which the second and third strands of our theories of change, uh, of our theory of change uh, link up. Um, and you can follow across the arrows, as it were, between any of these four strands, and you'll see those various ways uh, in which they do interrelate and, uh, and lead into one another. And that, I hope, helps uh, to explain how these are necessarily interrelated, necessarily interwoven, necessarily strands uh, of a rope that will be far stronger um, if they are all um, present. Um, and that helps, I hope, to explain how our theory of change is different from the theories of change of most other um, organizations which aim to effect transformative change, which are often based on relatively simplified models of how we're going to do uh, what we need to do, uh, which imagine shortcuts, which don't imagine all these four um, strands. So if we lose that slide now, please. Um, what I'm referring to there is that uh, there are um, there is a tendency, a widespread uh, tendency. Um, if we could get rid of that slide, please. There is a, a widespread tendency uh, among um, those engaging uh, uh, in the endeavor to have transformative change. Um, to encourage people to think that that change is easier than it actually is. And what we say is no, this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Um, there are no shortcuts, there are no one size fits all answers. It's not just go and sit in the road, it's not just vote green, it's not just such and such technology is going to save us. Uh, none of these things by themselves are going to be anywhere near uh, enough. We need this complex uh, interwoven 
set of actions which are going to involve huge numbers uh, of us. Uh, and it's probable that if you're on this call today or watching this video, that you are still relatively in a situation of being a kind of a, a pioneer or an innovator uh, in this space. But more and more people are coming into this space. And as I said earlier, we have um, good reason, and I've only given you a, a small fraction of it, to suppose that this is actually a change which is occurring um, across the population now, that more and more people are stepping into this space of climate concern, of climate awareness, of a desire to know what can I actually do? And what we in the Climate Majority Project are trying to do is to suggest meaningful ways in which people can actually be part of this climate majority and be part of this great endeavor, uh, this great work, uh, whether that be um, mobilizing in your community, which is gonna happen more and more to build a resilience, to grow your own food, uh, et cetera, or whether that be acting through your workplace, um, if you're a lawyer or if you're a journalist or if you're a, a teacher or if you're an insurer uh, or if you're a civil servant, uh, or whether that be in some other way, acting perhaps as a parent or as a member of a, uh, of a faith uh, community. To some extent, of course, it's obvious that a lot of this is already going on. What we think needs to be added is the, uh, the richness uh, that is present in our theory of change and the understanding um, that um, this is starting to happen, that it must and will happen more. And that, as I say, the only open question is, will it happen enough? And we in the Climate Majority Project are trying to ourselves provide some particular ways for that people can uh, get involved in this uh, transformation. I mentioned the Climate Distress Campaign. Uh, I mentioned uh, our adaptation campaign that is beginning. We're also working now with, uh, with businesses on trying to get them to use their greatest power, uh, which is to lobby the government for change and to say, you know what, it's not possible for us to do this ourselves through corporate responsibility corporate social responsibility or whatever, um, ultimately um, the changes that, that are required are going to require substantive change uh, from, uh, from governments. But again, as I say, there's no shortcut to that. If you're supposing that this coming election uh, is going to fix everything, uh, it's hard that, to imagine that there are very many, very many people thinking that after Labour's latest massive backtrack. But if you are supposing that, um, that is an illusion uh, and it is going to take time. That means there is going to be quite a lot of suffering uh, and damage along the way. That is just how it is. That is another part of the difficult truth that needs to be faced and can be faced and can be held uh, together. So if this is resonating with you, then great. And I look forward to discussing with you the, both the resonances and any tensions. Please do consider going to the Climate Majority Project website and uh, signing up. Could we have the uh, the final slide now, please? Uh, the Climate Majority Project, uh, you can find us at climatemajorityproject.com. Uh, you can sign up there. You can potentially get involved in our climate distress campaign. You can potentially get involved in uh, one of the organizations that we're incubating or, or collaborating with. Or maybe um, there is an organization that doesn't yet exist that you need to be involved in setting up. Uh, if that's the case, then, of course, we're potentially interested uh, in hearing from you. Uh, maybe you, you are someone who would want to get involved with our uh, business campaign. These are some of the main ways in which this complex call to action, which is variable upon who you are, what your passions are, what your talents are, what your capabilities uh, are, what your resources are, along with other people, to address this. There is no way of addressing this if we stay in our silos as individuals. We need to gather with other people and see ourselves as part of something much bigger. And that is the really exciting thing. When human beings uh, across this country and indeed across the world, because ultimately that's what it'll take, come to see that, for example, if they are a corporate lawyer or if they are somebody who is uh, growing food along with others in their local community, or if they are a teacher attempting to uh, deal with the rising climate anxieties of their of their kids, or if they're a parent doing the same, uh, then actually they're all part of the same struggle. We are all part of the same struggle. Uh, and one more thing also I'll throw into uh, the mix here. If you are interested uh, to know more, uh, and I'm going to stop talking in just a second, 
um, then there's also this our book that is just out, The Climate Majority Project, setting the stage for a mainstream urgent climate movement. Uh, you can buy this in all good bookshops as usual, or you can also get it on our uh, website. It has a foreword by Lord Deben. Uh, it has endorsement quotes from Salim Hook, uh, Ian McGilchrist, uh, John Alexander, um, and Pettifor, Jeremy Lent, and, uh, and others. Um, and um, yeah, that's about it uh, from me. Thank you so much for listening. And now uh, let the debate begin. Thank you very much, Rupert. Um, I felt like we ended on a positive note there, despite the very bad news on the on the climate, that there is a way forward if we join together. Yes. Um, I'm going to go straight to the comments and questions. So the first one from Pat McGee is around the data you had at the start. And Pat's obviously not convinced on that data. I just wondered if you could follow up on I'll just read it out. I can't disagree more completely with the ideas that the man in the street is now more convinced as your initial slide suggests. So do you have something more to say about where that came from and what you're feeling about the general public? Well, um, what can I tell you? Those are those slides were from uh, an Ipsos Mori um, yeah. survey that was done with, uh, with to their uh, rigorous standards. Um, and without revealing too many trade secrets, I can yeah. tell you that it was not easy to get that survey uh, done. Yeah. Uh, people get real had a real um, struggle um, with people in Ipsos Mori who were um, uh, concerned that um, the the questions they were asking might upset people. Uh, right. Who were concerned that the results of the polling might upset people. Uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and various related things. It was a very interesting process. I can't really say more uh, no, that's about right. it. Um, so but the bottom right. line is that uh, this was uh, this was an Ipsos Mori survey, and that's what it said. Mm -hmm. uh, if you disbelieve in all opinion polls, that's up to you, but that is the, mm -hmm. that is the evidence. Now, what Pat might be meaning um, is that there is, as I said at the time when I presented those polling results, there is a difference between what people say in answer to polling questions and what mm. they will actually do when, for mm. example, they're confronted with uh, difficult questions involving change uh, in their own life or change at, at the level of politics or society. Um, and what that means is that there is a job of work to do. And the job of work to do, that's exactly what we need to do to make sure that, uh, that um, we follow up, if you will, um, uh, and start to enable people to take part in some of those kind of changes. The way I presented our theory of change, I kind of suggested that uh, you've got the first strand, the second strand, the third strand, the fourth strand. The first strand was the, was the truth, the difficult reality. But of course, there are other ways into this. You can come into it from the, the third strand as well. You can yeah. just start taking action uh, and then um, uh, reflect more on what that means or what it's leading to and so forth. That's the way that works for some people. Um, let's look at what uh, Pat's following up by saying. The real yeah, problem. Sorry, is what, it's what yeah. you said, really. It's about the negative impact, and what I think it's what you're trying to tackle with the emo around the emotional distress that when yeah. people perceive that. And actually, this is about um, the real problem is the public are unwilling to accept any perceived negative impact on their lives. I guess that's more about so you can't mm. use your car. Um, but if we're talking yeah. more about solutions and um, and how, like you were talking about, the positive impacts here and now, and it not being about, you know, future generations. And yeah, I, I think. Yes, absolutely. It's 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 uh, future generations, absolutely vital. Um, but uh, it's also got to be understood in the here and now. So so look, it's about pain points. And again, it's, uh, Pat is right that um, that people, when they start to feel um, pain in their uh, in their um, own life. Um, may um, start to be unwilling to undertake climate action. But that cuts mm -hmm. both ways, right? So um, it, the way it cuts both ways is this. Firstly, as you say, um, if people start to, to see something um, positive in their own life uh, coming from this, uh, in terms of, for example, you know, whatever it might be, uh, better public transport, um, better um, um, air source heat pumps, um, solar panels, et cetera. There's likely to be a lot of, uh, of, of new um, subsidies and support for those coming in the next few years with the likely 
uh, change of uh, of government, um, or whether it be um, people finding um, community and the stuff that they do together. When, for example, in our village, we've just um, planted a, a community orchard uh, together here, uh, and people f found that you know just a really kind of brilliant experience. We had an enormous turnout; about ten percent of the entire village uh, turned out to to dig uh, these uh, these trees in. Um, uh, so there are ways you can turn the pain into positive, but also the way it cuts both ways is that um, there, there are pain points that can be perceived. Um, for example, the Amok example I gave earlier, or the way that people are starting to see that their children and indeed themselves are potentially at risk uh, from all of this. Um, that can change the equation. Uh, and yeah. that's part of what we need to do. So, look, I totally understand uh, Pat's level of uh, of concern or or even um, despair. Um, but I would say um, that let's not have a council of despair. Let's let's look to the ways in which that situation can be changed and the pain can be turned into something positive. Thank you. And that, that's exactly I've just put a comment up from John Gray saying exactly the same that you're just coming to there. That this discovery that people can act now that we don't have to wait for governments because our my feeling is that's part of the negativity that you're getting more and more depressed because we can see our governments aren't acting yeah. but the way to feel more positive is to get on act ourselves and not wait for them that's right yeah so this is fundamentally about uh, empowering us uh as communities uh as parents together uh as colleagues at work together whatever it might be uh, yes, I think that anyone who now thinks that governments are going to are going to lead and are kind of proactively going to going to take us out of this uh, is uh, well is on hiding to nothing. Uh, what we have to do um, is change um, the political class in one way or another, uh, and and what that requires um, is for us to uh, to change and for us to initiate uh, change. Uh, and so, yeah. yeah, that's how it is exactly as John says. And, and when they see that that's what we want, then they'll do the things that only governments can do because there are things we need governments exactly. to do. Exactly. And that's the point of our business campaign. You know, it's not going to happen overnight. But the idea is, what about if we could over the next five to 10 years, as the impacts hit harder and harder and harder, uh, convince business people to turn their immense power, their greatest power, their power mm. of lobbying um, onto governments and say, mm. you know what, we, we're we not after any more short term kind of kickbacks and uh, regulatory loopholes and so forth. This is an existential threat. No profit, no profits on a dead planet. Uh, we mm. want you to act. We are turning the power of our lobbying to say, force us to do the right thing, or in particular, you know, force the laggards to do the right thing, force yeah. the people who would undercut others by engaging in um, dodgy, uh, dirty, uh, ungreen business practices to do the right thing, create a, a higher level playing field for all. The working title of the campaign is Regulate Us. Um, mm. And we think this is a really exciting idea, not exactly whose time has come, but whose time is coming. Uh, and, uh, and the idea is to, to make that into reality uh, over the next, uh, over the medium term. Thank you. Um, and then back to, we've got a question from Sue Clements or a comment about people yeah, agreeing theoretically, and you did mention this when you brought up the stats at the beginning, but when you actually ask them to do something, then it's a bit yeah. different. Yeah, absolutely. I think we've already um, talked about so how, this. But how I do we just... reach those people? How do we reach those people? I mean, what, yeah. Well, it's partly about it's partly about pain points. It's partly about helping people um, with their imagination. So, um, one of the things that we're doing in the Climate Majority Project, and one of the things that I'm particularly doing, is working with uh, artists, uh, dramatists, writers, uh, entertainers, uh, who, of course, have a particularly vital role in helping us to imagine alternative uh, possible futures. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, for example, there is um, a play that is inspired by uh, my work. The play is called Phoenix Dodo Butterfly. Uh, it has a um, tour that is happening this year uh, in uh, the east of England. Not, I'm afraid, in Northumberland yet, but that may change. Um, it's Arts Council funded. And the idea is, the idea is that there are three possible futures sketched in these 
three playlets they are really uh, dodo future you can probably guess what that's like mm -hmm. uh, right. a phoenix future where uh, we we experience societal collapse but managed to recover from it and a butterfly future in which we managed to transform without having to endure um, societal collapse now right now we're heading plainly for dodo and also uh, phoenix is uh, is is pretty grim in many ways people sometimes mm -hmm. say to me oh phoenix that sounds good yeah i like that mm -hmm. and i say you do know that you know for phoenix only comes right. from ashes yes. right yes. <laughs> you got to have a death first uh, mm -hmm. so so that's a, an example another example in this field of what i call throughtopia of throughtopian imaginations how we get through what is coming in the best way uh, possible that i want to strongly recommend to people um, is a book by Stephen Markley called The Deluge, uh, a huge uh, throughtopian uh, novel uh, imagining the next uh, generation in the United States, uh, not shying away from the grimness of a lot of what is going to happen uh, in the political sphere, in the ecological sphere, etc., but also suggesting uh, some ways in which we may be able to uh, get through that and actually in some ways capitalize as we have to do uh, on the awareness on the on the pain that will occur uh, but what i'm saying right about these imaginative examples mm -hmm. um is that wouldn't it be great uh if the the if the pain points that start to make a, a difference uh and uh help us into transformation were imagined rather than actually lived or experienced you know wouldn't mm -hmm. that be a smart thing to do and that's how yeah. i think that um that art and uh, film and so forth has an enormous role and there is a change happening now. Um, some of you may have seen, if you haven't, I would strongly recommend you to see it, um, the recent ITV drama After the Flood, which is very interesting mm -hmm. about this, taking climate uh, damage and uh, and flooding as uh, our new reality. Um, then there's the film, which is still in some cinemas, uh, The End We Start From, uh, with uh, Jodie Comer. A uh, remarkable film about, uh, again, about flooding and about our possible climate uh, future. Um, th these things are starting to suddenly, pretty suddenly, happen. We had virtually nothing uh, in the realm of fiction and imagination, uh, in TV especially, mm -hmm. until very recently that was in this field of, uh, of climate and ecology. And now suddenly it's, it's, it's happening. That needs to be supported. We need to experience those things and we need to share them. You know, this is one of the, one, a very kind of simple thing that people can do. Uh, get your family or friends or workmates or whatever, uh, who are perhaps not as conscious as yourselves uh, of, the, of the trouble that we're in, get them to watch uh, After the Flood or um, The End We Start From. Uh, yeah. or get them to read uh, The Deluge. Make sure you read The Deluge yourself as well, though, because it is a fantastic, uh, empowering uh, uh, experience. So that would be my answer on that point. Thank you. That's a good place to start. Um, and Ed Jarvis is asking um, what support and resources you and the Climate Majority Project need to accelerate this really important initiative. Well, Ed, um, I must say I'm delighted by this question. I've got to tell everybody this question is not a plant. I, I don't know, uh, Mr. Jarvis, um, uh, and I'm going to jump at uh, the chance to answer uh, the question. So, look, uh, this starts with what you can do, as I was saying in my talk, right? Um, the most important thing is to figure out what you can best do along with others to become part of and manifest the climate majority. And for some people, that may be uh, joining one of our incubatees or collaborators. Uh, for others, it might be setting something new up. Uh, for others, uh, it might be joining one of our own campaigns, um, perhaps our climate distress campaign or um, the new uh, adaptation campaign that I'm just getting started with. Um, for others, it might be something different again. So, for example, if there is someone uh, watching the, the call who has money, uh, then we would like your money. Uh, we have uh, um, quite significant um, financial uh, support, um, including from the Open Society Foundation, um, but we need a lot more. We don't yet have any full-time staff. All our staff at the moment are part-time and then lots of other people are volunteers. Um, we are, as you can tell, enormously ambitious. And if, like Ed, uh, you think that what we are doing um, is essential and, and required, then I would urge you to support us and get involved in whatever way possible, including financially. Uh, so we'll be having a, an, another uh, crowdfunder in the not too distant future, or you can go on our site now and donate. And obviously I'm especially interested if there's anybody out there who is able to give us a really substantial sum. We have had 
um, very, very substantial private donations that enabled us to get started. We wouldn't exist at all without uh, those. Uh, and that's something that some people, uh, a minority, uh, can do. And if, if that's what you can do, then, that, then that's something important to do. But what I'm really trying to, to say is uh, it's, it's different strokes for different folks, right? Mm -hmm. Get involved in one way or another in the most powerful way you can. Uh, uh, for some people, a minority, that will be money. For most of us, it will be um, through your through your passion and through your knowledge and through your organizational capacity or your or your network or whatever it may be. We've just got a, a, a thank you, Rupert. We've just got another um, book recommendation up there from Sue. <laughs> that is not something that I that I know. So that's interesting. Um, it sounds like it's got something to do with uh, with um, biology. Um, yeah, I'm afraid I don't know about it either. Yeah. <laughs> um, please put any more um, comments, questions in the comment box um, while we're waiting for another one. I'll just make one up. <laughs> um, I was just interested at quite near the beginning, there was an explicit um, mention to carbon emissions. And I yeah. just wondered if the Climate Majority Project, is that like the, all the focus? Because I find that quite difficult myself when it's just about carbon emissions and not about everything else that needs to be done. You know, if the focus is purely on that, you can make what I think of as unwise decisions. Yeah, sure. So uh, at, a, at a, a rich question, which I'm, I'm hugely in sympathy with. Um, first thing to say on that is, even when you're thinking about climate, it's absolutely not just about carbon. Right. Mm, exactly. um, so it's about it's about the totality of greenhouse gases. So uh, methane is very important, for instance. Um, it's about um, sinks as well as sources. Uh, in other words, it's about things like preserving uh, our oceans and crucially preserving the Amazon and other rainforests. Uh, if we don't have um, uh, trees, etc., to mop up the excess carbon that we're stupidly putting into the atmosphere, then we're we're much worse off. Um, in fact, of course, any any proper sophisticated understanding of the climate um, predicament understands that it is inextricable from um, ecology, uh, that we, we yeah. can't think about it adequately without thinking of, about the earth as essentially uh, a living system or a system of, uh, of living systems, a system uh, of, uh, of ecosystems. Uh, and you can't extract um, climate, let alone carbon, uh, from that. Uh, moreover, um, thinking about uh, even thinking about climate and ecology uh, is not enough. Firstly, because you need to think about the the, the social uh, and political implications of that. So you need mm -hmm. to think, for example, about inequality. Um, yeah. So people occasionally say to me, oh, look, why don't you just back um, socialism or communism or, or something? Mm -hmm. That would sort things out. And my response is, well, firstly, everybody knows that that isn't going to actually win over a majority in our modern world. So it's not practical. But secondly, there's something um, slightly different, which is practical, which is to start from the position um, of assessing realistically and rigorously the climate and uh, and ecological uh, emergency or more than emergency actually it's worse than an emergency the term emergency mm -hmm. understates it emergencies are mm -hmm. something you can fix this is something that we are in now for the long uh, haul um, you start from the parameters of the climate and ecological emergency and that itself suggests reasons why it's necessary to have uh, a less unequal society because for example there just is no future uh, in which um, people are using private, in which a minority of people are using private jets as much uh, mm. as they are. Obviously, there's no future in which everyone's using private jets. Um, mm. But but even just um, the amount of private jets we've got at the moment, there's no future with those. So no. it means that that rich people are going to have to give up um, more of their carbon footprint than poor people are. Um, yeah. So what that means is that when you understand the, the, the climate and ecological more than emergency uh, adequately, uh, you understand that its own logic um, requires a more equal society and a more uh, just world. Mm -hmm. That's the way we, uh, we get to push in that direction, not by saying, let's all sign up to, uh, to, to socialism. Um, mm. Ultimately, we may be able to convince people, including 
um, conservative minded people. And, and one of the things that is crucial about the Climate Majority Project to understand is that we do have um, conservative minded people who are in active support of it. I mentioned Lord Deben, for example, he's one. Um, um, ultimately, we may be able to enable um, and some already get this, people like um, Lord Deben and Chris Skidmore, we may be able to get them to understand um, that uh, the world we need to move into uh, is one which is not so extremely unequal, not because uh, uh, we uh, love uh, Karl Marx or whatever, but because that is just for the reason I outlined a minute ago, um, uh, a sine qua non, it's an essential. Uh, we don't get yeah. to get what we need to without that. And finally, yeah. just to broaden it one stage further, um, it's not even just about climate and ecology and um, some kind of level of, uh, of uh, basic social justice. There's also a, what's called a, a poly crisis going on. There is a crisis that has numerous dimensions involving basically everything. Uh, you could think of the poly crisis um, as the everything crisis. So uh, for instance, um, AI. Uh, AI is, is becoming in our judgment uh, an existential threat um, quite uh, quickly in various ways that I won't try to go into uh, here, but mm. some of you will be well aware of what those kind of ways are. Um, so having said all of that and having complexified the situation so much, you might ask the question, well, then why are you called the Climate Majority Project? Yeah. Why not be called the Polycrisis Project or something? Uh, and the answer to that question really is that climate is the threat that is most understood so far uh, and is the threat which... Um, which is coming to uh, destroy us uh, unless we um, uh, change our path. There might be a way through what's coming um, which doesn't um, uh, adequately address uh, the AI um, crisis. We might get lucky on AI. There is no getting yeah. lucky on, on climate. No, it's we already there. The, firmly yeah. off a cliff. We are already flying off that cliff. So climate is kind of where it starts. And if you start to pay adequate attention to climate, then you can bring in ecology and social okay. justice and AI and so on. And eventually um, you'll have a, a majority on all those things too. Thank you. I'm just gonna quickly go back to the book recommendations. So Clade is about um, three generations of an Australian family as climate change develops. And we've got oh. another one, down the, um, Kimberly Hare is suggesting we look out for a new book coming out this summer called At the Edge, What is Mine to Do and Who All right, well, that's it? Kim's book. Yes, uh, so I know I know Kim and it's a splendid book. <laughs> I've written a, an endorsement for it. So yes, Great. I would recommend that book. Uh, Kim Hare, uh, What is Mine to Do um, uh, at the Edge. Um, uh, yeah, a helpful way for people if they want to, to go further into this question of figuring out uh, their own role um, in this collective future. And the question we've got at the moment, up just to summarise that, it's basically there's an example that there's already policies and legislation in place for um, sound insulating buildings, and yet people don't live in that because the builders, the developers, don't implement them. So even if there are, mm. well, it, the end talks about multi-pronged and awareness approach. I guess that's what you were talking about, though, making sure that corporations are involved as well and that they're um, kind of self-policing and not just relying on um, top-down yes. regulation. I think that's I think that's uh, right, but also this is about and potentially, if I've understood what Viv is saying correctly, uh, mm. truth telling and uh, if necessary, whistleblowing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I would also add that, uh, of course, the the basic thing she's talking about um, here, um, the the question of kind of insulation, being able to live in comfort without destroying. Uh, the, the planet. Uh, this is such a no-brainer and such a great place to start. It is absolutely absurd that we live in a country where most of us in our homes and other buildings are heating the sky. You know, that's what we do. We heat the yeah. sky. Yeah, a, exactly. third of, a third of British buildings have essentially no loft insulation. How is that even right. possible? Well, most of them are rented. Right. where the and that brings me uh, that brings in equality and social justice as well, because people yeah, are living absolutely. in... So, so yeah. it's it's a win-win-win uh, to act on yeah. that. Uh, one of our key collaborators is, um, uh, on the local level, is Retrofit Balsall Heath uh, in Birmingham, who are doing a brilliant job of uh, of challenging this on the local level where they are. And and initiatives like Retrofit Balsall Heath um, 
could be occurring and and ideally hopefully should be occurring all over the country and that will increase the pressure for the next uh, government to do the right thing on insulation thank you we're nearing the end of our time so i can't quite do everyone just we had a comment about um bringing in the arms industry in terms of their impact on the climate and also about working directly with other organizations like xr and greenpeace but i just wanted to go to nova brockbank's question about spreading these ideas that you've got in the climate majority throughout the world so is that's a good question is your project just a uk or europe or how is it working that is a good question it's a great one to end with i i think uh like ed jarvis's question it's a question i very much welcome and once again i'm happy to be able to tell people that i do not know nova brock bank but I, I thank nova very much for the excellent uh question uh look the climate majority project has begun here in the uk we are seeking to prove concept uh in the uk for example to influence um the uk government on the question of climate distress to to um, make more of this resourcing happen uh, in educational um, settlements as part of what the climate distress uh, campaign uh, is about. Um, but of course, Nova, you're absolutely right. And I have said this in, in my talk and in answer to other questions, uh, obviously this is a global issue ultimately. Uh, so we need to think uh, globally just as we um, act locally and uh, and nationally so how can we spread this I these ideas globally so i would say uh, three things um on this uh firstly well let's just do it spread the word um something which is quite encouraging is that this uh, book the climate majority project um we are finding that loads of people are buying it in the united states uh, we're not quite mm -hmm. sure why but it's a very encouraging uh uh, uh development uh secondly uh to let you know that while we are seeking to prove concept uh, here in the UK, uh, we are uh, already liaising with people uh, in other countries and again would encourage others here to do the same, um, especially in countries such as uh, Germany and uh, France uh, and indeed the United States. Uh, and we are working with one or two people in the United States who are interested in bringing some of what we're trying to do in the Climate Majority Project directly to uh, the USA. Uh, mm -hmm. And thirdly, um, to put this in in terms of how this could work if if what we do is succeed to some extent in proving concept with this climate majority idea mm -hmm. in the uk over the next five to ten years uh, it will influence the rest of the world yeah. uh, the example of what's been achieved here will spread you saw that in a more sort of viral way with extinction uh, rebellion um and in fact you know it's interesting people in other countries such as germany um, actually, to some extent, you might be surprised the extent to which they look to this country for a bit of leadership uh, in uh, this kind of area, partly, I think, because of the XR uh, experience and the way that XR began in the UK and then was sort of exported. Um, mm. So we strongly believe that if the Climate Majority Project is successful over the next uh, several years, that it will, in effect, uh, be uh, exported uh, and will be uh, adopted and hopefully it will be able to succeed in actually making the transformation, which takes time, in a yeah. way that the radical flank ha has not been able to succeed. The radical flank has done a fantastic job, and I was proud to be a part of it back in yeah. 2019, at raising the alarm. But what I try to suggest here today is that we need to go beyond raising the alarm to actually yeah. making the transformation happen in the way that I sought to lay out uh, in this uh, Hexham debate today. Thank you, Rupert. That's an excellent ending there. So. Um, I feel like we have had a, this is a positive way to, a call to action, um, obviously with the, yeah. the bad news is the context. Um, so yeah. thank you very much, Rupert, for all that information and um, yeah, encouragement to keep going. Um, well, uh, it's my pleasure and, and thanks everyone for their, for their really uh, vigorous questions. <laughs> Great. Yes. Thank you for the questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. And um, I'll maybe put them the book list up somewhere because there was more suggestions and mm, that would be a great um, idea so i'm just going to briefly introduce our next online debate it will be at 11 a.m on saturday the 16th of march and that's going to be jude curtin darling who's deputy secretary at industrial europe speaking about the present day role of trade unions in the uk and europe in improving working conditions however before that on saturday the 24th of february also at 11 a.m We've decided to carry on with the in-person panel discussions we trialled last year. 
and the first one will be on the subject of protest. What place does protest have in a democracy, um, which is particularly pertinent at the moment with ever increasing legal restrictions on protest in the UK? So there'll be a panel of three speakers with local and regional knowledge who will discuss the issue with an emphasis on local what local solutions can be found. Um, the panelists will speak briefly and the rest of the time will be for discussion. And this will be held along with the other, we'll have two more further discussions at, in Hexham at the St Mary's Church Centre on Hencoats. So you're all welcome there. It's free to come, but um, you can give donations in person there. Um, and we will be putting up um, information about that online text donations I mentioned earlier. I think that's it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to, Peter sat next to me doing the tag. If I've done everything. You've done everything, yeah. <laughs> if people do want to donate to support the Hexham debates, um, if you can scan this QR code with your mobile phone, um, it sets up a text to donate five pounds to support the Hexham debates if you wish to do that. Or if you want to uh, do it in a different way, you can contact the Hexham Debates via their Facebook page. So thank you all for joining us today and hopefully see you at the next debate. And if you're able to, to come in person um, to our panel discussion before that. And thanks again, Rupert, for all your time today. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye, everyone.